Good day, my name is Tian Gildenhuis and in this video I would like to discuss the extremely important subject with, with you, namely, Jesus is coming again, be ready. Or in other words, the rapture of the saints and the second coming of Christ, which is a thing that so many people debate about and argue about and don't want to believe in because they don't really know what the Word of God says about this. And it is all about our Lord Jesus Christ, so let us pray together first. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you that the Bible says we two or three are gathered in my name. I am in the midst. So Lord, we know you're here where we're busy with the production of this video, but you are also there where people will be watching this video. And we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will take me out of the way, that I will not be the one speaking, but that your Holy Spirit will speak in and through me regarding this very important subject. But Lord, that your Holy Spirit will also be the one convicting everyone watching this message regarding the truth of your word so that we can be ready for the second coming of Christ. And Father, thank you that you give us the authority to say to Satan, we bind your works now. Wherever this video will be watched and where we are busy now is holy ground and you will not steal this message from the ears of the children of God and you will leave in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord Jesus, we pray that you will cover us with your blood now. We pray that you will set up your angels all around us and that you yourself will be a wall of fire around about us, according to Zechariah 2 verse 5, so that every place will be a safe place, and that you alone will be glorified, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we know your word is true, and reveal it to us now through your Holy Spirit, we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. In the world out there, there are different views regarding the rapture or the end times. I'm showing you a little picture there now, where the green arrow represents the timeline of time from the beginning to the end of time. Then we are presently in what we call the church period. And some people believe that there will be a pre-tribulation rapture. And I am one of those people. And on this video, I will discuss why I'm one of the people believing in the pre-tribulation rapture. Some other people say, no, 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 no. We must go through the first three and a half years of the tribulation here on earth. And then there will be a mid-tribulation rapture. Some other people say, no, 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 we must go through the whole seven years because we must suffer as Christ suffered. And then there will be a post-tribulation rapture. And after that will be a thousand years of peace. People usually refer to the pre-trip, the mid-trip or the post-trip. And I always say to the people, no matter what you call the trip, are you ready for the trip? Are you ready for Jesus' coming? And there are different views regarding this and the end times and the eschatology. You have the preterists who believe that the book of Revelation was finished when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and was only applicable to the believers in the first century AD. The futurists believe that the book of Revelation must still be completed and I'm one of those because I believe certain things in the book of Revelation has already been uh, fulfilled but certain things are still outstanding. The amillennialists believe that there will be no thousand years of peace on earth, only in heaven. The premillennialists believe that Jesus comes before the start of the thousand years, and the postmillennialists believe that Jesus comes at the end of the thousand years. So you can see there is a lot of confusion out there regarding the rapture or the end times and what will exactly happen in the end times. And the question always is, but where does the term rapture come from? Where does the word rapture come from? And this is from a Catholic tract where it is written that the term rapture is derived from the text of the Latin Vulgate of 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17. We will be caught up, which is in Latin, rapiemur. And the moment you show this to people, they say, but you see, that's why I don't believe in the rapture because it is a doctrine that was brought in. It's a heresy that was brought in by the Roman Catholic Church. I can tell you today it is not true. Because the Roman Catholic Church does not believe in the rapture. Let us look at their own views regarding this. You'll see there at the bottom of the slide uh, the specific person's work that I used in my research. And uh, you will see this is a Catholic view of the rapture. So what is the Catholic view of the rapture? The phrase shall be caught up together in the Latin is simul rapiemur. The word rapture comes from the Latin of this passage. The verb rapio refers to carrying something away quickly. Since this passage is a part of sacred scripture, the idea of a rapture cannot be dismissed as being non-existent, they say. 
However, the exact meaning of this passage and of shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air must be carefully considered. There is a widespread idea among Protestants that the rapture is an event whereby God takes a select group of faithful Christians out of the world before the tribulation. This idea of the rapture is incorrect and contradicts sacred scripture, says the Roman Catholic Church. Since the dead rise first, the rapture occurs at the time of the resurrection. And since those who are left do not precede the dead who rise, the rapture cannot occur before the tribulation, they say, nor any time before the resurrection. In summary, the rapture is not an event whereby the faithful are removed from the world before a time of suffering. As Christ suffered, so also must the church suffer, says the Roman Catholic Church. And I will show you today that I do not agree with this view of the Roman Catholic Church and even some Pentecostals and even some Charismatics and even people of the New Apostolic Reformation who do not believe in the rapture. I will show you today what I was shown by the Holy Spirit from my Bible. But the point is, Jesus is coming again soon very soon. Are you ready? And on this video, we will discuss the following nine points. Number one, the signs of the times. Number two, he will come for his saints. Number three, and he will come with his saints. Number four, our bodies will change. Number five, as in the days of Noah. Number six, the ancient Hebrew marriage ceremony. Number seven, learn from the ten virgins. Number eight, saved in the tribulation. And number nine, the great significance of the rapture. And all who know me know I always start with this verse in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 13 in the King James Bible. For we write none other things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. And today you will read with me what the Bible says regarding the second coming of Christ and the rapture of the saints. And you will see it is very clear just as it is written. Because Jesus gave us a warning in Matthew 22 verse 29 and he said, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. And that was my problem for 36 years of my life until 1999 when I met the Lord Jesus personally. I erred because I did not know the scriptures. And because I did not know the scriptures, I did not know the power of God. But why did I not know the scriptures? Because I did not know the author of the scriptures. I was not in a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And only when I got to know him personally. And at that time I was an elder in the church. So what does that tell me? You can be an elder in the church and do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I did not. I did not know him intimately, personally. I had a relationship with my reverend, yes, and with the other church council members, but not with the king himself. And only when I met the Lord Jesus personally, and if you have not yet done that, at the end of this video will be a prayer that you can pray to ask him and receive him into your life so that he can start to lead you through his Holy Spirit and with his word so that you can be ready. Because if we look at what's happening around us now in the year 2020 with the coronavirus and all the fear and the lockdowns and everything and everybody is going into fear, if you know what this word says, you will understand what we are seeing happening before our very eyes is the fulfillment of prophecy in Scripture. And it makes me excited because I know my King is coming and I'm ready to meet Him. Are you? But you see, we will have to see what the Bible says regarding this. Because Satan so causes division and arguments and debates among Christians about this very important message that nobody wants to be ready. They're so busy debating, they're not getting ready. And I really pray that the Holy Spirit will reveal the truth to you today and that you will also be ready for the return of our King. At number one, we will now look at the signs of the times. And again, at the bottom there of the slide, I give uh, acknowledgement to every person whose research I also used in this work of mine. And I don't just have this video, I also have a book. Uh, and it's a free ebook. I will show you the link a little later that you can also download to read. And in that book of mine, I give much, much more information than what I give on this video. 
But Dr. Henny Prince Lawyer here in South Africa did a whole series on the return of Christ and he counted the verses. And he said there are a thousand four hundred texts in the Bible that refer to the second coming of Jesus. There are 216 chapters in the New Testament with 319 references in those 216 chapters to the second coming. On average, one out of every 30 verses in the New Testament refers to the second coming. All nine authors of the New Testament refer to the second coming. In 23 of the 27 books of the New Testament, we read about the second coming. So will you agree with me if we look at this, that the second coming of Christ is an absolute fact regarding the Bible? I have no doubt about that. But let us now see what Jesus himself said, what the signs of the times will be. In Matthew 24 verse 5 we read, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And so we read that Dr. Monty Elof wrote that there are presently no less than 27 people across the world all saying that they are the Christ. For example, Maitreya, who has millions of followers across the world. Then there is the famous Sai Baba, who also has thousands of followers. People sell all their possessions just to go and stay close to him. In the same manner, there are others who have smaller groups following them, and most of them do great miracles. And the interesting thing is, even here in Pretoria in South Africa, we have a person calling himself Christ in his church. And so, have I seen in Mexico, and I've seen uh, videos of people in Australia and all over calling themselves the Christ. So if I look at this, I can see before my very eyes, this prophetic word spoken by Jesus is being fulfilled right before our very eyes. Then Matthew 24, verse 6 and 7 says, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. And people get so troubled when they hear the rumors of wars and when they hear of wars. The Bible says, do not be troubled. Why? For all these things must come to pass. This is what we must understand. So many people say, why are these things happening? Because God is God. And he said, all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And the inter interesting thing there is that the word nation in the Greek is ethnos. It means ethnic group. So what are we seeing again being fulfilled before our very eyes? Ethnic groups rising against other ethnic groups all over the world, and kingdoms against kingdoms. So again, these words spoken by Jesus are being fulfilled before our very eyes. And there shall be famines, he said and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. In other words, earthquakes in places where there has never been earthquakes before. Now let us look at some statistics regarding wars just in the 20th century. 65 million people died in the First and the Second World Wars. From 1900 to the year 2000, 130 million people died in wars. From the year 1945 to the year 2000, more than 143 countries participated in wars. And if you Google for yourself countries at war today, you will be surprised to see how many countries are actually participating in wars in this very moment in the year 2020. Famine. The World Health Organization said 11.3% of the world's population is hungry. That's roughly 805 million people who go undernourished on a daily basis. In 2010, an estimated 7.6 million children, more than 20,000 a day, died because of famine. So would you say, if we look at this, that the words Jesus spoke about famines are being fulfilled before our very eyes? Definitely so. Pestilences. Presently, there are 200 different cancers, killing more than 6 million people per year. Malaria, 3 million deaths per year. The World Health Organization said regarding tuberculosis that in the next 20 years, 70 million people will die therefrom. AIDS, more than 100 million deaths in the world. People dying from that or, even, or, or presently dying or, or having died because of AIDS already. And then we also look at the SARS virus, the bird flu virus, the Ebola virus, H1N1, and the coronavirus that is now the big thing in the year 2020, etc. So would you say that the words Jesus spoke that we will see pestilences is being fulfilled right before our very eyes? Very definitely so, yes. Earthquakes. Look at the interesting statistics here. In the 17th century, over a period of 100 years, 
278 earthquakes were recorded around the globe. In the 18th century, over a period of 100 years, 640 earthquakes. In the 19th century, over a period of 100 years, 2,119 earthquakes. And in the 20th century, approximately a million per year. This is now from the smallest kind of earthquake to the big ones, which averages about 2,700 per day. And it's interesting in the Bible, we will look at the verse just now, where the Bible says, just before the coming of Christ, these things happening will be like a woman going into labor. And all the ladies who have been in labor will tell you that it intensifies. The closer they come to the birth, the birth pangs intensify. They get closer together and they intensify in, 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 in feeling and emotion and all that. So you, can you see it here? You can actually see it in the earthquakes happening over the earth. And Jesus also said in Luke 21, verse 25 to 28, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And we've seen that. We've seen that with the red moons that we've had the past few years. We see the things happening in the stars. We know about uh, uh, the Wormwood Comet that is coming towards the earth that NASA knows about. There's enough information out there regarding that comet that is on its way to earth. Because the Bible says these things will happen. And upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. The nations are distressed. Why? Because of the depressions, the recessions, their money is worth nothing. All the sicknesses, all the pestilences, all the wars. The people are in distress and in perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. What are we seeing more and more these days? Tsunamis and the floods all over the world. And then the very important part that Jesus said here, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. And this is what we're seeing very clearly today, even with the coronavirus. People are nearly dying of fear of getting this virus. So they're buying stuff and they're running around and they're so afraid. Why? Because Jesus said these things will happen. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Are these things beginning to come to pass? Very definitely, yes. So what must we do? We must look up for our blessed hope. Titus 2 verse 13 says, Our blessed hope, our King is coming. And lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Don't walk with bowed shoulders looking down upon the earth crying and whatever. Cry toward your, to your God, yes. Cry out to Jesus Christ because He is the only answer. And then He said in Matthew 24 verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Through churches, missionaries, evangelism, TV and social media, the gospel of the kingdom has now been preached in all the world. And what then? And then shall the end come. So my dear friends, we must understand we are very, very, very close to the end. If we look at these signs of the times that Jesus himself said will happen before he comes. And in Luke 12 verse 42 and 43 we read, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Jesus is coming back. What is he going to find you doing? Will you be busy teaching people about Jesus when he comes? Or will you be busy drinking, fornicating, swearing, cursing, busy doing corruption? What will you be doing when the king comes? In other words, those who are ready for the rapture. Do not sit and wait to fly away as many people mock. And unfortunately, some of those scoffers are other Christians, Protestants, Pentecostals, Charismatics, people who did believe in the rapture in the past but don't believe anymore. I would just praise the Lord. I grew up in a church that did not believe in the rapture, but the Holy Spirit revealed this to me himself. So I know that this is the truth. Now, the people who are ready for the rapture are actively busy to give the Lord's household their meat in due season. In other words, their spiritual food, which will make them spiritually ready for their Lord's return. 
but they also teach the people how to handle the tribulations coming against us in this time. What I'm showing you now is my ebook on the rapture of the saints. You can find it at that link at the top of the page. And in this book, I handle a lot of other stuff that I don't have time to discuss on this video. Things like tribulation versus wrath, because people don't understand that we are presently going through tribulation. We are being persecuted because we are Christians. But the seven years of tribulation that the Bible speaks about will be the seven years of the wrath of God being poured out upon the earth. And it's not applicable to us as his believers who are making ready for the rapture. I discuss it in much detail in that book and you can download it for free. You don't have to pay a cent for it. You can just go and download it from that page and then read it for yourself. I discuss in there the righteous protected and the unrighteous destroyed. There are many examples in the Bible of the righteous being protected and the unrighteous being destroyed. They don't go through the same things. I discuss Israel versus the church, Israel as nation versus the church of Jesus Christ, because that is a very important subject that we don't uh, uh, take note of regarding the eschatology, the end times, and what will happen in the end with Israel as nation and with the church of Jesus Christ. They are two different entities. They must not be confused with each other. I discuss the 144,000, who they are, because they are 144,000 Jewish men. And it's very clear from the Bible, but I discuss it in the book. One wedding, two brides. What will happen to the nations during the thousand years of the millennial reign? Who will we rule over during those thousand years of the millennial reign? Is the pre-trip rapture only a modern doctrine as many people mock? I discuss it there and I quote a lot of people who wrote about the rapture in the first century, the second century, the third century. So we know that the rapture is not just a modern doctrine as people mock and scoff. And then false rapture versus true rapture. If the rapture is false, why is the kingdom of darkness planning a false rapture? Because you cannot forge a forgery. You can only forge a true product. But this is all discussed in the book. Some of that I will touch on as I go through this video. But there is a lot of information contained in that book that I don't discuss on this video. So feel free to download that book for yourself. It is available on the internet. And this is another ministry that I can really tell you that you can go and watch his material. It's Amir Tsarfati. His website is beholdisrael.org. He is a Messianic Jew. He believes in Jesus Christ. He also discusses the rapture and what will happen in the rapture and after the rapture and all that in much detail on his website. And he has a, a weekly update of what's happening in the Middle East and in Israel. And you can really watch his stuff as well. There are many other people also discussing the truth of the rapture and that we must be getting ready for that. And I can't show all their names, but I know Amir Tsarfati being a Messianic Jew. It's interesting to listen to this man. Because he is a Jew and he comes from the Jewish background and he also proves the rapture in all his stuff. So you are welcome to look at his stuff as well. But so there are many others that you can also look at. Just beware that Satan will not try and pull you away and make you doubt the rapture so that you are not ready. Because that's what Satan is a master of deception, is he not? He wants to deceive us. He wants to pull us away from the truth. And unfortunately, unfortunately, he is very, very successful with that, with many Christians. People who really love the Lord, but still being deceived because they've been so confused over, is it true, is it not true? Is it the Roman Catholic Church, is it not from the Roman Catholic Church? Let's just get back to what the Word of God says. And you will see, there is no doubt about the rapture, about us getting ready, because Israel versus the church, Israel will not be in the rapture, except those people like Amir Zarfati, who became a Messianic Jew by receiving the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. They will be in the rapture because the moment that they receive the Lord Jesus, they actually are not Messianic Jews anymore. They are New Testament believers in the church of Jesus Christ, just as I am a New Testament believer in the church of Jesus Christ. And the church of Jesus will be in the rapture. Those who get ready, as I will show you today, will be in the rapture. Israel as a nation will stay behind, unfortunately, because there are many prophecies in this book 
where God confirms that there are certain things that He will deal with Israel during the end times in the seven years of tribulation. But as I say, there is so much information. I cannot discuss it all on this one video. Get my book, watch Amir Zarfati stuff, and also ask the Holy Spirit to lead you to the people who really stand up for the truth of getting people ready for the rapture so that they will be ready for their king. I pray that you will be one of them. At number two, we will look at he will come for his saints. People struggle to see Jesus' second coming as two occurrences. Firstly, for his saints, his bride, to take them to heaven, and then later with his saints out of heaven to come back to earth. We read in J.V. McGee on prophecy, man's fascination with the future, he said the following, Christ came into the world as a baby. After Jesus' birth, scripture is silent. We have no other report until about 30 years later. Well, we know this, the one report where Jesus was 12 year, years old and he stayed behind in the temple. But for 30 years, there is a period called the silent years in the life of Christ. That is a very important period. Yet we are told almost nothing about it. This coming of Christ is for redemption. The first aspect or appearance was incarnation when Jesus was born as a baby. The second aspect or appearance was redemption when Jesus died on the cross. Now, there is a wide difference between the two. A little baby, incarnation, and a man on a cross, redemption. Anyone, I am sure, would recognize the difference. But we do not call that the first and second coming of Christ. We package it up in one coming, which is proper. We do the same thing for His coming for the church. Then later is coming to establish His kingdom on the earth. We put both in one package. And I can see nothing wrong with that. There is a wide difference though between the rapture and the revelation. The difference is not only in time. At the rapture, He comes as the bridegroom to take His bride, His church, out of the world. Remember that He does not come to the earth at that time at all. At the revelation, He comes as a king to the earth to establish His kingdom here upon the earth, His physical kingdom. And we read in John 14 verse 2 and 3, Jesus says, In my Father's house, where is that? That's in heaven, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Clearly, Jesus is coming again to receive us unto himself, to be where he is. Where is he presently? In heaven, in the home of his Father. So firstly, he will come for his saints to take them to heaven. And it's only those saints who are getting ready for this. During this catching away, the rapture, only those who are ready and will be caught up will see him, not the whole world. And people say, what do you mean with this? Why will the whole world not see him? You see, we don't agree with this secret rapture that not everybody will see him. Well, let me ask you the question. After Jesus rose from the dead, after three days, who saw him? during the 40 days that he was still here upon the earth? Only his faithful followers, only his faithful disciples saw him. The rest of the world did not see him. So it's the same principle. When he comes again for the rapture, only his faithful followers who are ready and getting themselves ready will see him, not the whole world. And that verse can't refer to when we die, because then those of us who are born again will go to him. He does not have to come again to receive us unto himself. The word is also clear that he goes to prepare a place for us in his father's house. He doesn't say that he comes back to prepare a place for us here on earth. So there will come a day that we will be in those mansions in our father's house. And that is with the rapture. You see, the people of the post-tribulation rapture believe that we will go up in the air, meet him in the air, and come straight back to earth to be here for the thousand years of the millennium. So when will we be enjoying those mansions that he has prepared for us then? Only after the thousand years? 
No, it's during the time of the seven years of tribulation here on earth, which will be the seven years of the marriage supper of the Lamb and being with Him and receiving our rewards in heaven from the King. Now in verse 3 of John 14, Jesus says, I will come again and receive you unto myself. The words receive you unto myself in Greek is paralepsomai, coming from the root word paralambo, which means to take by force. What Jesus is really saying here is, I will come again and take you to me by force. It is also interesting to note how Thayer's Greek lexicon explains the meaning of the word paralambo. It means to take with oneself, to join to oneself, an associate, a companion, to take with one in order to carry away. Look at that, to carry away, not to stay in one place. To take one's betrothed to his home. That is what paralambo means. Oh wow! So very clearly then, the word that Jesus used in John 14 verse 2 and 3 refers to taking his companions. Yes, his friends as he said in John 15 verse 15. Yes, his betrothed to his home. And that home is in heaven. And we read in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 15 to 18. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For, number one, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, number two, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and number three, with the trump of God, number four, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, who are the dead in Christ? They are the people who have received the Lord Jesus in their lives and who have died. They are the dead in Christ. And they will rise first. Why will they rise first? Because... You and I, who are still alive at this moment, we consist of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. But those who have died in Christ, their bodies are in the graves here on earth, but their spirits and their souls are with God in heaven in this moment. I believe it with my whole heart from what I've read in the Bible. So in that moment, when Jesus descends from heaven with a shout, those dead of Christ, their bodies shall rise first. Why? So that their bodies can be united with their spirits and their souls again in the twinkling of the eye, as the Bible says, so that they will also receive a glorified body consisting of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. What will then happen? Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up, and the word there is harpazo, together, with them, who are they? With the risen ones in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Look at this now. We're not meeting him on the earth. We're meeting him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. For the people who believe that we as Christians will be in the other three and a half years or seven years of tribulation, how can we comfort each other with these words? Because it is not very comforting to think that we may have to be in the tribulation. Because, my dear friends, if what we are presently experiencing in the world with the coronavirus and the lockdowns and the things the governments are doing, if that is just one tenth or one millionth of what the tribulation may be like, I don't want to be here. So that's not very comforting to think we have to go through the tribulation or as the Roman Catholic Church says, as Christ suffered, so also must the church suffer. Do we really have to? Then he has died for nothing. But it is very comforting to know that we who are ready will not be in the tribulation as we will be with him in heaven during the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that is why we can comfort each other with the words that we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And these verses can't refer to the second coming of Jesus, because at his second coming, that is after the seven years of tribulation, all of us, those who died in Christ and rose first, those who were raptured, and those who will die during the tribulation, will come back with and rule and reign with Jesus here on earth for the thousand years of peace, not in heaven. And we find the confirmation of that in Revelation 5 verse 9 and 10 that says, And they sung a new song saying, 
Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Not in heaven, on the earth. Then in Revelation 20 verse 4 we read, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, that is during the seven years of tribulation, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And Quickly, people say to you, yeah, but remember, there's a verse in the Bible that says a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years. Okay, so are you telling me then that Christ is going to reign upon the earth just for a day? No, Jesus Christ is coming to this earth to rule here for a physical thousand years and we will reign with him upon the earth for that same period of time. Now, let us look at the word harpazo. The word that says we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. What does it mean? This is a Greek word which has various meanings. It is not translated by one uniform English word. The meanings are as follows. To seize, to carry off by force, to claim for oneself eagerly, to snatch out or away. It was used proverbially in the sense of, now look at this, to rescue from danger or destruction. What is the rapture all about? To rescue the church from danger and destruction. Those in the church who are ready. It was used also of divine power transferring a person marvelously and swiftly from one place to another. That is what our Pazzo means. We will be transferred via Jesus' divine power marvelously and swiftly from earth to meet him in the air. And where do we also read this word Arpazo in the Bible? In Acts 8 verse 39. Philip who baptized the eunuch and where they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away, and the word there is Arpazo, Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And the next verse says, and Philip was found in another place. So that means that the Spirit of the Lord, divine power, transferring a person marvelously and swiftly from one place to another. He was moved from there to another place. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 2. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up, and the word again there, Harpazo, to the third heaven. This was Paul himself who was caught up to the third heaven, divine power transferring a person marvelously and swiftly from one place to another. This is what will happen at the rapture as well. That divine power will transfer us marvelously and swiftly in the twinkling of an eye from the earth to Jesus in the air and then we will go with the, to be with him in heaven for the marriage supper of the Lamb. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1 to 4 we read, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child. You see that thing? As travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. In other words, God's children who are ready will escape. But there are a few things that we must think of when we look at this verse. That the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now let me ask you quickly. Many of you out there watching this video might have had a robber enter your house at some stage stealing some of your stuff, breaking into your home and stealing your stuff. So let me ask you, how does a thief operate? Does he phone you before the time and say, listen, I'm coming to your house tonight. I'm going to break into your house and I'm going to steal your stuff. Does he do that? No, he does not announce his coming. And then secondly, when he gets to your house, does he walk into your house and then only steal your kitchen garbage in the garbage bin? Does he do that? No, he comes into your house and he steals the best, the best you have in your house. And then after having taken those things in your house, does he go and sleep in your bed waiting for you to come back home? No, he doesn't. So a thief comes into your house. He steals the best of your stuff. And then he leaves immediately. 
The Bible says Jesus is coming as a thief in the night. So he will be coming when nobody expects him. It is called the imminency of Christ. He will be coming when nobody expects him. He will take the best, his bride, his betrothed, his companions, his friends, those who have made ready for him. Those ones will he steal and then he will leave immediately. He will not hang around here upon the earth any longer. But it's also interesting to note that this verse says, when they say peace and safety or peace and security, sudden destruction will come upon them. And you can do yourself a favor. I also write about this in my book. But just listen to what all the prime ministers and the kings and the queens and the whoevers throughout the world are having uh, discussions about. All over the world. Peace and security. Peace and safety. And the Bible says, when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them. But you, my brother, you are not in darkness so that that day will fall upon you like a thief in the night. So are you getting ready, my friend? Are you getting ready for the coming of our king yet? Now what is imminency? In doing some research on the doctrine of imminency, I noticed few people take the time to actually define what prophetic imminency means. First, let us look at the general definition of the key word imminent, the quality or condition of being about to occur. Imminency, as it relates to Bible prophecy, simply means that the return of Jesus Christ for the church can happen at any moment. No warning signs will indicate a short-term countdown. We as Christians remain on alert 24 hours a day, 7 days a week because we have no way to refute the fact that we will not know the timing of our Lord's return, the tribulation is a barrier to the rapture. No wonder the late John Wolford called imminency the heart of pre-tribulationism. This type of any moment language doesn't fit a post-trib rapture. If Jesus were prevented from coming until after the battle of Magog, the rise of Antichrist and the mark of the beast, we would have no need to watch for him before the tribulation. And that's what we must understand. If you know Jesus is coming like a thief in the night, there's nothing else that must happen in the meantime. We can't say to people, listen, he's coming like a thief in the night, but don't worry, the, this must first happen and that must first happen. And only after seven years, then he will come. No, no, that's not imminency anymore. And we also read in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Again, as I said, the seven years of tribulation that are coming are the seven years of the wrath of God upon this earth. It's not the same as the tribulation that we experience as Christians because Satan hates us and persecutes us. Jesus said in John 16 verse 33, he said, uh, you will be persecuted upon this earth. You will have trouble upon this earth, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we know we will be persecuted. It's a fact 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 also tells us that. But during those seven years, those seven years are the days of the wrath of God. And God hath not appointed us to wrath. Now who does he pour out his wrath upon? In Nahum 1 verse 2 we read, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. His adversaries and his enemies, not his children who love him, who get ready and who are getting ready to see him and to be with him. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8 says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on, number one, them that know not God, and number two, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see here, there are two groups of people being discussed here. That the vengeance of God in those seven years of tribulation will be upon them that know not God and upon them that do not obey the gospel. In other words, it's people that know the gospel but do not obey the gospel because as I will discuss and as I discuss in my book, there will be believers staying behind, those who are not getting ready for the rapture, those who are mocking and scoffing and not believing in the rapture. And you see, the interesting thing is that the Bible says 
in the end times there will be scoffers coming saying, but when are these things going to happen? See, just by scoffing, just by mocking, they are actually fulfilling biblical prophecy. So I just start to smile when people start to mock me when I discuss this or when they scoff at me when I discuss this. And I just say, thank you. You're just confirming the biblical prophecy through your own mouth. And then people say to me, but Tian, is there really a verse in the Bible that makes you believe that there will be a pre-tribulation rapture? And I say to them, yes. This is the verse, Luke 21 verse 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always. Look at this, pray always, not just once a week. Pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And remember now, Luke 21 is the chapter where Jesus is discussing the signs of the times. And while he's busy discussing the signs of the times, he gives, he gives this verse. And he says, watch and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy. That means if you don't watch and pray always, there is a possibility that you might not be accounted worthy. But if you watch and pray always and you are accounted worthy, you can escape all these things that shall come to pass, not just some of the things. So this verse also confirms that there will not be a mid-tribulation rapture. It does not say so that you might be accounted worthy to escape some of these things that shall come to pass. No, it says all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. And another verse that also confirms it to me is Revelation 3 verse 10 that says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That has not yet happened. That hour of temptation is the seven years of tribulation, of the, the seven years of God's wrath, of his vengeance upon the earth, and it will come upon all the world. And if I make myself ready, if I get myself ready by watching and praying, ensuring that I'm living a life of sanctification as I will discuss, etc., then I will know. He will keep me from that hour of temptation because then I will be with him in the rapture. And Luke 17 verse 34 to 36 is one of the verses that we know also confirms that only those who are ready will see him. Because he says here, I tell you, in that night, that is the night when the bridegroom comes, there shall be two in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. So the rapture will be so sharp that it will cut between a husband and a wife. The husband believes in the rapture, the wife does not believe in the rapture. And that night when the bridegroom comes, when the trump sounds, she will hear a sound, open her eyes and her husband is gone. Where is he gone? Well, not to the neighbor's wife. He has gone to be with his king. He has, he has made himself ready for the rapture. And the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. So people say, yes, I understand two in the bed at the night. But what about the two in the field? Because this will happen all around the world. And the world is a round sphere. It is not flat as the people in Babylonia used to believe. So we must understand this. This will happen all around the world in the twinkling of an eye. Children that did not want to listen to their parents will wake up when they hear the trump. They will listen to the sound or they will hear this uh, extremely loud sound. And when they wake up and they run to their parents' uh, 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 room, the parents will be gone because the parents made ready, but the children didn't want to listen. And while I'm saying this, I don't want you to go into fear now. In my book, I also discuss the fact that all children under the age of 12 will be taken with the rapture. They will not stay behind. So you have 12 years within which to teach your children to get themselves ready. After 12, they must make their own decisions regarding spiritual things. They are not mature regarding all other stuff, but regarding spiritual things. They must make their own decision. So you've got 12 years. But in those 12 years, if Jesus should come now and your child is 2 years old or 5 years old or 10 years old, they will be with Jesus. You don't have to worry about that. So if I can try and show this to you in a little picture format, there's a little thing that I drew myself. We have the Father's house, that's heaven. Jesus came down to earth from heaven 2,000 years ago to die on a cross. Then he was resurrected. He went back to his Father's house. In the last 2,000 years, we find ourselves in what we call the church dispensation or the church time. And then at some stage now, 
the rapture will happen where those who, may, who are getting ready in the church will go up in the air to meet Jesus in the air and then we will be with him. The marriage supper of the Lamb will be in heaven. But we will also see the Bema seat of Christ because there are three judgments. I discuss it in detail in my book. There's the Bema seat of Christ, which is the judgment of the righteous where we will receive our rewards. I also have a YouTube video on rewards in heaven. That is the time when we will receive those rewards. Then after the seven years, at his second coming, will be the sheep and goat judgment, which is the judgment of the nations who stayed behind during the seven years of tribulation. Then we have the thousand years of peace. And after the thousand years of peace comes the great white throne judgment. And that's the judgment of the unbelievers, those who died not believing in Christ. They will be judged at the great white throne. So we as righteous believers will only see the Bema seat of Christ. The sheep and goat judgment is not applicable to us. The great white throne judgment is not applicable to us. But I discuss that in my book. So then we will have the marriage supper in heaven. There will be seven years of tribulation upon the earth. Three and a half years of tribulation and then the Antichrist will reveal himself as God as we will see now. And then after that another three and a half years of great tribulation. And then will be the second coming of Christ when we will come out of heaven with him. The Antichrist and the false prophet will be put in the lake of fire. Satan will be bound for the thousand years. After the thousand years Satan will be unbound for a short while. He will get together the Gog, the Gog and the Magog for war. But fire from heaven will just consume them and then Satan will also be put in the lake of fire where the Antichrist and the false prophet are already for a thousand years. And only then the great white throne judgment will come and only after that eternity starts with a new heaven and a new earth. And you'll see at the bottom here, I also have the Gog and the Magog war because we read about Gog and Magog twice, which is in Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is the war of, the, of Gog and Magog, which will happen just around the time of the rapture. But the one after the thousand years of peace, Satan will try to get Gog and Magog uh, together for war, but they will just be consumed by fire from heaven. It's all in the Bible, just as it is written. So, are you ready yet? These things make me excited. When I see these things happening, I see the fulfillment of the prophecies around me, and I know that it's all written in this book. You know, I can't wait to be with my king and to understand that what I believe... It's written here, I'm going to see it, I'm starting to see it already around me. But all these other things about what's happening in heaven and what we will see in heaven, what we will experience in heaven. Wow, what an awesome future to look forward to. And it might happen very soon. It might happen today. It might happen tomorrow, next year. But are you ready? No matter when it happens. Because if you are ready, remember he will come as a thief in the night. I am so ready for Jesus to come and steal me away. Are you? At number three, we will now look at, and he will come with his saints. At number two, we looked at, he will come for his saints. Now we'll, we'll look at, he will come with his saints. From the Bible, it is clear that a short time later, Jesus will return again with his saints. This is the second coming. After the seven years of tribulation have ended, when Jesus comes back with his saints to rule with us here on the earth, at this second coming, the whole world will see him physically. And we must understand. Some people say, no, if there's a rapture, you're actually referring to a third coming then. No, no, no. Jesus put his feet upon the earth at his first coming. And he will put his feet upon the earth at his second coming. With the rapture, he's not putting his feet upon the earth. We will meet him in the air and go to be with him in heaven. So there are only two comings. The first coming when he was born as a baby. And the second coming when... He will put his feet upon the earth again. And then the whole world will see him physically. Revelation 1 verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. Now look at this. Who are the ones who pierced him? The Jews. People say the Romans. No, 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 sure, the Romans crucified him. But it's because of the Jews asking for his crucifixion. So, the ones who pierced him, the Jews, will see him coming on the clouds. That confirms that Israel as a nation, those who do not receive the Lord Jesus before the time, will be upon the earth when he returns with us after the seven years. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Matthew 24 verse 30 says, 
And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Which tribes of the earth? All the tribes of the earth. Because when He comes, they will suddenly realize all their different religions mean nothing. They were lied to. They were deceived. And they will mourn because they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And you must understand one thing. This was spoken by Jesus Himself. So I do not agree with the new apostolic reformation view that we are the corporate crush today. And that He will not be coming upon the clouds because the clouds are the clouds of witnesses around us and all these things. The deception that people are taught that there will not be a man coming upon the clouds. That man is coming. His name is Jesus Christ. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And they will mourn. Even some of those believers who were deceived and listened to their apostles and listened to their prophets, believing that what their apostles said and their prophets said, instead of, instead of listening to what the Bible says, they will also mourn because they will be staying behind for those seven years. And what will happen when he comes back? Zechariah 14 verse 4 and 5 says, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Look at that. His feet. Not the corporate Christ. Not anybody else but Jesus Christ. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. Look at that. It does not say some of the saints. It says all of the saints. Now, how will they come with him if they've not been with him in heaven? So we will come with him from heaven. And you know, Zechariah wrote this about 500 years before John wrote the book of Revelation. And then we see John says in Revelation 19 verse 11 to 16, 500 years after Zechariah. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Who's that? Jesus Christ. On his head were many crowns. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. You see, because Jesus is the living Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And many people say, yeah, no, no, but those armies, they only refer to the angels coming with him. No, 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 I'm sorry. The angels will be with him, yes. But we will definitely be part of those armies. How do we know that? Because we must look at what those armies are wearing. They're clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And the Bible always explains itself. And so we read in Revelation 19 verse 8, Arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. My brother and my sister, the angels do not wear the righteousness of saints. The saints will be clothed with the righteousness of saints. So those armies which followed him upon white horses, clothed with the righteousness of saints, are the armies of saints, together with the angels, coming out of heaven. And what will that look like? So many people have tried over the ages to, to try and depict this. But I found this picture on the internet which actually explains it to me the best. Here we see these armies coming out of heaven with Jesus at the front, with his clothes dipped in blood, and with the rest of us following him, coming out of heaven. Now my question is, will you be on one of those white horses behind him over there? Or will you be down here where you see this fire and brimstone going on on the earth? Because you stayed behind for the seven years of God's tribulation, God's wrath, God's vengeance. Where will you be in that picture on that day? Down upon the earth wailing and mourning when you see him coming because you actually missed the chance to be with him because you believed the opinions of people and you did not make ready for the rapture? Where will you be? Wailing and mourning upon your knees among the rocks down here below or on one of those white horses coming back with the king? Because we must understand one thing. When Jesus was here the first time, he was here as the lamb that was slain for us. When he comes back that day, the second time, he comes back as the lion of Judah. 
who will rule the world with an iron scepter, with a rod of iron, the Bible says. When he's coming back that day, he's not coming back to play games anymore. He's coming back to rule the world. Then we will see the fulfillment of theocracy, where Jesus becomes the political, physical, and spiritual ruler of the world, where he will fulfill his office as king and priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, who was a king and a priest. In that time, when Jesus comes for the second time, he will be king of the world, and he will be the priest of the world. And we can be with him, now and forever, or you can stay behind, not believe what I'm telling you and what other people are telling you, believing the deception of people, staying behind and wailing among the rocks when you see this happen on that day. Because we read in Colossians 3 verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Again, Forget the whole deception regarding the corporate Christ. It does not say you shall appear with them in glory. It says you shall appear with him in glory. That him is a single person, Jesus Christ. And when will he appear? That day that I showed you with this picture. And then shall ye also appear with him in glory. If you made ready for the rapture and you were in heaven with him on that day when he appears in glory, you will also appear with him in glory. Romans 8 verse 19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creature, that word also means creation, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now unfortunately, the latter rain teachers and the deception that came in with the latter rain and this even believed in some ways by the new apostolic reformation to this very day, they believe that we are the manifestation of the sons of God now. No, no. No, no. That day, that day, we will see the manifestation of the sons of God. Why? Because on that day we will return with him with glorified heavenly bodies, the same type of body that Jesus has, as we will look now. Because you will walk to a dead tree and you will say, live, and the tree will live in a moment. You will walk to a dead field where there's nothing. You will say, let there be a crop and there will be a crop. Why? Because you will have exactly the same kind of body that Jesus has. So the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. And it will happen on that day, my brother and sister. No other day. Mark 13 verse 33 to 37 says, Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch because remember, Jesus will come as a thief in the night. You do not know when the master of the house cometh. At evening, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Lest he suddenly comes and finds you sleeping. Will you be asleep when Jesus comes? Asleep in your sin? Asleep in your fornication? Asleep in your gambling, in your addictions, and in your not wanting to follow the Lord? Where will he find you? Because the Bible says you must watch. So what we've looked at now... Jesus came to earth, we have to 2,000 years of the church dispensation, then there will be the rapture, there will be the marriage supper upon the earth, the seven years tribulation, and then the second coming, when he will come with his saints. That's what we looked at now. So are you getting ready? Are you getting the picture yet? That the Bible is actually clear about the rapture. See, but again, Satan so used the word rapture and made us so argue regarding, but the word rapture is not found in the Bible because it's a Latin word, that nobody wanted to get ready for this. Because they thought, no, it's a Roman Catholic thing. Stay away from the rapture. No, no, you better get ready for the rapture. You better get ready. If you're not ready yet, you must start praying. It's never too late. Even if Jesus comes tonight, you can pray today and say, Lord, please, touch my heart. Touch my life. I want to be ready when you come. Because the time is running out very fast, very quick. And I really pray that the Holy Spirit will convict you about this because I cannot, but I'm ready. I so look forward to be with my King in all eternity. What a future to look forward to. 
Number four, we want to look at our bodies will change. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51 to 53 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, in other words, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Just look at that. It's not going to happen over a period of five minutes, ten minutes, one hour, two hours. You see these videos that people send around of the rapture happening and you can see people going up slowly into the air and people looking after them and crying after them. No! The Bible says it will happen in the twinkling of an eye. How quick is the twinkling of an eye? It's a split second at the last trump. Now when is the last trump? When the bridegroom comes at the rapture. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Remember, it's those who have died in Christ. They will be raised incorruptible. So their bodies will then be united with their spirits and souls who have been in heaven at that time. So they are now also receiving a glorified body as spirit, soul and body consisting of three parts. So again, the view that you sleep in the grave until Jesus comes and then you stand up and to be with him is just the body. The spirit and the soul was already with Jesus when you died. So now the three are getting together again. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we, living at that time, shall be changed. For this corruptible, and I put in the word their body, this corruptible body, must put on incorruption. And this mortal body must put on immortality. And just there, we have a thing that we must take note of, and I discuss it in my book as well. You see all these movies coming from Hollywood about the apocalypse happening, and then some immortals come from another planet to be with the mortals upon the earth. And the moment that you tell people, but that's what the Bible says, there will come a time upon this earth, after the seven years of tribulation, when we come back out of heaven with Jesus, with immortal bodies, to be with people who have come through, who have uh, survived through the seven years of tribulation, because they won't all die. Many of them will die. About a quarter of the world, world's population will die, the Bible says. But they won't all die. So if we come back, we will have people here having mortal bodies, like we have today, and we will have people having immortal bodies. So we will have mortals and immortals upon the earth. And people say, you're watching too many videos. You're watching too many movies. No, 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 I don't watch any movies. I read the word of my God, because this is what he says will happen. Will happen. But you see, Satan is in charge of Hollywood. Where does Satan come from? He comes from heaven. Satan knows this book better than you and I. Satan knows what this book says. So what does he do with all these movies that we all watch? He desensitizes the people by letting them think, ah, it's a load of rubbish, this is just movies. It's movie stuff, this. That's not movie stuff. This is heaven stuff. There will come a day that we will have immortal bodies like Jesus had. 1 John 3 verse 2 and 3 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, and we know when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, that means immortal, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath this hope in Him purifieth himself even as He is pure. And just in this verse, I want you to understand, this is one of the conditions of being ready for the rapture, is that you purify yourself just as Jesus is pure. Because I have this hope in me that I will see Him as He is, and therefore I purify myself. I strive after a life of sanctification. I also have a YouTube video on Be Ye Holy. The sanctification, the walk of sanctification. I also have a YouTube video on authority in holiness. It's all about this. This is part of getting ready for the rapture, of being ready for the rapture, by striving after sanctification, of living holy lives, purifying myself, even as Jesus is pure, because I know when He shall appear, I will be like Him, for I will see Him as He is. What a wonderful thing to look forward to. And Philippians 3 verse 20 and 21 says, 
for our conversation, the word there in the Greek also means our citizenship is in heaven. You see, I'm just temporarily living in South Africa or in England or in the USA or wherever. But my citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. And what does his body look like? Let's read John 20 verse 19. The day after Jesus was resurrected from the grave, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. In other words, a glorified body is not stopped by physical matter because Jesus actually moves through walls and suddenly just appears among them. It is also not just a spirit body, but it is a body that can be touched and that can eat food. Where do I find that? I just read my Bible. In Luke 24, verse 36 to 40, we read, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Even today, people say, No, but Jesus only rose from the dead spiritually. Now look at this. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? In other words, doubts arise in your hearts. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And Luke 24 verse 41 to 43 says, And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and an, an oven honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And did you know a spirit can't eat? And we must understand one thing here. The Bible says in Romans 10 verse 9 and 10. If you confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth. And if you believe with your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. So if you still doubt whether he was raised from the dead physically. You cannot be saved because this is what we must believe. We must believe from our hearts that God raised him from the dead physically, not just spiritually, not just metaphorically, not just symbolically, physically, so physically that they could touch him. He said, come handle me, come touch me. And he ate with them. So the glorified bodies that you and I will receive, that we will have with him while we in, in heaven with him, with the rapture, and receiving our rewards with him and having the marriage supper. What are we going to do at the marriage supper? We're going to eat. Well, not meat, because nothing will die in heaven, but uh, fruit and whatever God gives us in heaven. Something to look forward to. But the thing is here, yeah, we must understand, if you do not yet believe with your heart that God has raised him from the dead physically, you are playing with your eternity, my brother and my sister. Stop listening to the opinions of people. Read these verses for yourself. Read your Bible for yourself because you will stand before the throne with this book. You will not stand before the throne with your minister or with your reverend or with your pastor or with your apostle or with your prophet. He's not going to be there. You're going to be there alone. And God's going to ask you, my child, what did you do with this book of mine? Why did you just listen to the opinions of people without checking them for yourself? Why did you not check whether what they said was so or not? As the Bereans did in Acts 17, verse 10 and 11. You must make a decision. What are you going to do with this knowledge that I'm giving you today? Are you still going to listen to the opinions of other people? Or is the Spirit already stirring in your heart that you want to be with Jesus one day? That you will also have that glorified body, an immortal body that can never die again, that can never sin again. Glorious. What a wonderful future to look forward to. Are you ready? At number five, let us now look at as in the time of Noah. Matthew 24, verse 36 to 39 says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So if people give you dates regarding the rapture, you can start laughing immediately because only God knows the date. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark 
and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You see, there will not be a period of silence. Nobody will give a, a, a shout and then the world will become silent for an hour and then they will say, just wait for an hour. An hour from now, Jesus will be coming. So stop everything you're doing and let's wait for Jesus. No, no, no. They will be drinking, giving in marriage. They will be fornicating. They will be gambling. They will be swearing. They will be doing what they're doing until that moment that Jesus comes. But so many people say, yeah, but you know, in the times of Noah, only those who were with Noah were saved. They stayed behind upon the earth. So only the unbelievers will be raptured. That's what we learn from the times of Noah. Now let's see what the Bible says. Genesis 6, verse 5 to 14 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Would you agree with me that the wickedness of man is great in the earth today? Definitely. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. We see that today. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. We see that every day on the news channels all over the world. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And people say, you yeah, see, at the time of Noah, the unrighteous were destroyed and Noah stayed behind. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, God said to Noah, and he did. And then in Genesis 7, verse 16 to 23, we read, And the Lord shut him in. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark. And it was lifted up above the earth, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land died. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. But what people don't understand, what happened with the ark? It was lifted up above the earth. And the ark of Noah is a type, a shadow of being in Jesus Christ. So if we are in Christ, we are actually in the ark. And what happened to the ark is it was lifted up above the earth. So what will happen when Jesus comes? We will be lifted up above the earth to be with Jesus. Those who are making ready and getting ready to be with him. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1 to 4 says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of Jesus' is coming, shall not come, look at this now, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin, that is the Antichrist, be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Number one, I want to show you something here. The people of the New Apostolic Reformation, the apostles and the prophets say, there will be an end-time harvest, a global harvest. There will be millions of people being saved in the end time. No, no, no. The Bible says there will come a falling away first. And that word falling away in the Greek is apostasia. It means to defect from truth. So there will not be an end-time harvest before the rapture. In my book, I discuss the fact that, yes, millions of people will be saved during the seven years of tribulation. That is very clear, but not before the rapture. So, we see here that there will come a falling away first, and then the man of sin must be revealed, and he will sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Only after all that can Jesus come down to earth. Paul says there must come a falling away first. The Greek word which was used here is apostasia. The root word is apostemi. And this is an interesting word as it has two meanings. Little and Scott declare in their Greek lexicon that the word can mean a falling away or be a going away. So first there must be a falling away, but there must also be a going away. And then the man of perdition the Antichrist must be revealed, and after that Jesus can come. So there must be a rapture, then the Antichrist is revealed, and then the second coming of Christ. John Parker's Lexicon of London says, first meaning, a falling away, second meaning, properly, a departure. So what is holding back the revelation of the Antichrist? We read in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 6 to 9, and now ye know what withholdeth 
that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. When will that wicked be revealed? When Jesus comes. But look at this now. Who is keeping him back? Who is withholding him that he be revealed? We are, by praying for peace, by praying that, the, the, you know, these things must not happen and all that. We are keeping back these things from happening. So when the church is taken out of the way, only then can the Antichrist be revealed. Many people say the Holy Spirit must be taken out of the way. No, no, no. The Holy Spirit will not be taken out of the way because many people will still be saved during the seven years of tribulation and they will die for their faith. And you can only be willing to die for your faith if you still have the Holy Spirit with you. So it is not the Holy Spirit that will, will be taken out of the way, but the work of the Holy Spirit in the church, when the church is taken out of the way, yes, then the Antichrist will be revealed and he will be destroyed with the brightness of the coming of Jesus Christ. We read that in Revelation 19, verse 19 and 20. And I saw the beast, the Antichrist and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, that's Jesus, and against his army, that's us and the angels. And the beast, that is the Antichrist, was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, that is during the tribulation. These both, the Antichrist and the false prophet, were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And again, these refer to two persons. The Antichrist will be a single person. The false prophet will be a single person, and I personally believe that it will be the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. But the beast, the Antichrist, will be a single person because the Pope will get the people of the world to worship the beast and to worship the image of the beast during the seven years of tribulation. And both of them will be cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So again, we've seen now that it will, what, what will happen, we, we've seen the whole picture as I've discussed it a few times already, and you can just look at that again. When Jesus comes, the Antichrist and the false prophet will be put into a lake of fire. Then there will be a thousand years of peace and Satan will be bound, and we will see what happens. But let's go back to one little part here. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4 we read, So that he, that is the Antichrist, as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so many people scoff, and they say, but there is no temple in Jerusalem. Yes, but there's a third temple that's going to be built. We read in a rabbi's prophecy that the Jewish rabbinate in Jerusalem has already announced that the plans for rebuilding the Jewish third temple will be presented to the nation of Israel and the Jewish people on March 16, 2010. And we also go to Israel on a regular basis, taking tour groups there. And I've seen all the things of the third temple are ready in the temple institute. They are ready to be put in the third temple. The priests are being uh, um, taught how to do the sacrifices again and all that. They are ready. When this third temple is built, they will start with the sacrifices. But then the Bible says three and a half years later, the Antichrist will stop them from sacrificing again. So for the Antichrist to stop the sacrifices, the sacrifices must start again at some stage. And the sacrifices can only start when the priests can get on the temple bound. Now there's a picture I show you at the top left hand corner of what the second temple looked like in time of Jesus. And in the middle there is the uh, uh, holy place and the holy of holies. And people say, yeah, you see, but today we have what we have in the bottom right hand corner there, the golden dome of Islam. And if they break that thing down to build that uh, Holy of Holies and, and the Holy Place and the Holy of Holies again in the old place there, uh, the, it will be a third world war. Well, I've got news for you. They're not going to break it down. Why not? Because Revelation 11 verse 1 says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But look at verse 2. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And what is interesting, my dear friends, they're busy with some excavations below that temple mount, and they have actually found places that shows that the foundations of the true temple was not where it, that 
picture shows us at the top left hand corner but that it was actually built a little bit more to the north in other words they can rebuild it just next to that golden dome why because the antichrist will show himself to be the god of all religions he will stand up and say i am the god of all religions of islam of the jews of the christians of the hindus and you will worship only me so that's where it will be built and i've been there standing right there with that little red uh, arrow is showing on the right hand side there is more than enough space to build the temple there and that will be part i believe of the peace deal between the jews and the arabs if they can build that there because then the priests can offer their sacrifices but in that temple there the antichrist will then stand up, stand up and say but now i am god and you will not serve any other god so again the things happening around us makes me excited i can see it's happening i can see it happening before our very eyes are you getting ready yet i pray that the holy spirit will bring a hunger into your heart to start to read this book and to see for yourself that the bible is always true because god is god and is always true to his word At number six, let's look at the ancient Hebrew marriage ceremony. Because I always say to people, you will not understand the rapture if you do not understand the ancient Hebrew marriage ceremony. In that time, if the bridegroom wanted to marry a little girl, there was a marriage covenant and a contract price. The bridegroom would prepare a contract price or covenant to submit to the bride and her parents. It shows his willingness to marry her. The contract price was usually very high. Now look at the parallels here that God built into this. Jesus came to the house of his bride, that is the world, to submit his marriage covenant with us to us. The marriage covenant with us was the forgiveness of our sins. He then paid the extremely high bridal price with his own life. Now why would God use this as a parallel? Because he gave us the nation of Israel as a barometer of what his plans for the earth are. And if we know what he did with Israel and how he worked with Israel as a nation and is still working with them and what the Bible says about them, then we can see that God is still the same God and these things are true. Number two, the cup is given and drunk. When the bridal price was accepted, the intended bridegroom would offer his bride a cup of wine. If she accepted it and drank the cup, they were deemed to be engaged and was just as legally binding as a marriage itself. The engagement period was between one to two years in which the couple prepared themselves for the marriage and did not see each other. Look at that. They did not see each other for a year to two years. These days, after the second date, we move into the same house with each other. It's not the way they did it in the past. Now, Jesus also offered a cup to his bride with the institution of communion. And we, as his disciples, his companions, have accepted the covenant by drinking the cup. He has now been gone for two years, in which time we have not seen him. Number three, gifts for the bride. After the cup, the bridegroom gave the bride special gifts. The purpose of these gifts were to remind the bride about the bridegroom during the long period of the engagement where she will not see him. Jesus gave his bride the gifts of the Holy Spirit And he, the Holy Spirit, continually reminds us of our bridegroom who will be returning soon. Number four, the mikveh. During the engagement period, the bride went through a bath or a cleansing process. The word mikveh is the same word that is used for the baptism. The mikveh that Jesus provided for his bride as a similar cleansing process was the believers' baptism in water, that's the immersion, not the infant baptism of the Roman Catholic Church. I'm talking about the believer's baptism in water and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Number five, preparation of the bridal chamber. During the engagement period, the bridegroom would prepare a bridal chamber in his father's house. It had to be a beautiful place because the bridegroom and bride would spend seven days in it. Look at the number seven. The bridegroom could only go to fetch his bride when his father was satisfied with the preparation of the bridal chamber. Jesus told his bride that he goes to his father's house to prepare a place for us. And he also said not even the angels know when he will come for his bride. Only the father knows. Number six, the waiting bride is sanctified and prepared. While the bridegroom was busy preparing the bridal chamber, the bride was deemed to be sanctified, set apart for her bridegroom. 
However, she never knew when he would return, so she would prepare herself physically and spiritually and would buy herself cosmetic gifts. It was the tradition that the bridegroom would come to steal away his bride in the middle of the night. So she and her bridesmaids had to be ready at all times. We as God's people who are getting ready are now also sanctified and set apart for our bridegroom and we prepare ourselves for our bridegroom to return. The parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins show us that we must be ready and prepare ourselves for his return at all times. Number seven, the bridegroom comes for his bride. When the bridegroom's father was satisfied with the bridal chamber, he gave his son instructions to fetch his bride. The bridegroom then went secretly at night to steal away his bride and take her to the bridal chamber. But just before reaching the bride's house, he and or one of his friends would shout aloud and blow on the shofar so that the bride could have a warning. Noah also had seven days of warning. In the same manner, Jesus will come for us during the rapture because the Bible says clearly that he will come with a loud shout of an angel and with blowing of the trump of God to take us away to the place that he has prepared for us. And I think this message that you are listening to now on this video might just be your warning if he should come tonight or tomorrow or next week. Number eight, seven days in the bridal chamber. The bridegroom and bride then went to the bridal chamber, chamber where the marriage was solemnized. In that time, the marriage guests came together outside and in his father's house. The bridegroom's friends waited outside the door until the bridegroom confirmed that the marriage was solemnized. His friends then told the marriage guests who then celebrated until the two came out of the chamber and for the rest of the seven days they all celebrated together. This refers to the seven years of the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven and in the same time the great tribulation here on earth that we read about in Daniel, Ezekiel and Revelation. In that time we who made ourselves ready will be with our bridegroom in heaven and not in that great tribulation here on earth. Number nine, the wedding feast. The seven-day-long wedding feast brought an end to the marriage ceremony. In the same way, our bridegroom will have a wedding feast with us in heaven, as we read in Revelation 19, verse 7 to 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready, that is the bride. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints, as I said. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Those are the bridal guests. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Number 10. Then there is the return home. After the wedding feast, the bridegroom and the bride would depart from his father's house, where the bridal chamber was, to the new house that the bridegroom also built for them during the period of engagement. In the same manner, Jesus and his bride will depart from his father's house with his coming to earth, to the new house that he has prepared for us, first the thousand years here on earth, and then later after that, the new heaven and the new earth. Can you see the parallels? Can you see how God built the same things into what's going to happen? And if you understand the ancient Hebrew marriage ceremony, you will understand the rapture. This is what's going to happen, and I discuss it in more detail in my book. And I also know about many other authors out there and people having YouTube videos regarding this. I'm only touching the top of the iceberg, my dear friends, with this video. There are millions of other uh, uh, information articles, books, and whatever that can be read about this. But I tell you today, the rapture is a reality. The second coming of Jesus is a reality. You must get yourself ready. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will convict you in Jesus' name. At number seven, we are going to look at learn from the ten virgins. In Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13, we read, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. The virgins referred to believers, all ten of them. Because some, some people said to me, no, the foolish virgins were unbelievers. No, 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 no. They were believers. They, were, they went forth to meet the bridegroom. The unbelievers don't worry about the bridegroom. The oil, listen to me now. The oil refers to water baptism, not infant baptism. Water baptism, the immersion baptism of the believer. Baptism with the Holy Spirit. And a life of striving after sanctification, as I've already said now. Because the mikvah at the ancient Hebrew marriage ceremony refers to being baptized, 
and also being cleansed, and that's the baptism in the Holy Spirit as well. And also we, we looked at Philippians 3 verse 20, 21 that says, I must purify myself. That refers to striving after a life of sanctification. So these five foolish virgins were foolish by not doing what the Bible says we should do to make ready. And then we read, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Who slumbered? All ten of them. Our bridegroom is presently tarrying. He has been gone for nearly 2,000 years. Why? Exactly because of his great mercy that does not want anyone to be lost. You can go read 2 Peter 3 verse 9 for yourself. That is why we must beware that we do not all fall asleep. Because this verse says they all slumbered and slept. Even the five wise virgins. But somebody was awake. Who was awake? And at midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. So who was awake? The criers. Who were the criers? The friends of the bridegroom. Are you a friend of the bridegroom? Getting people ready? So maybe, just maybe, my voice is the voice of a crier today, speaking into your heart while you're watching this video. See, the bridegroom comes at midnight, when no one will expect it, as we've said more than once so far. And what must happen? We must go out to meet him. In our case, out of the world and into the air, as we already discussed. Just look again, that at midnight there was a cry. So there was a warning, as we saw earlier. In the same way, we will receive a warning just before our bridegroom returns. And I repeat, this video might be your warning. This video might be the cry in your ears. Are you ready? And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. Now, this verse also shows us there cannot be a post-tribulation rapture. Because... If this happened after the seven years, those five foolish virgins would not be able to buy and sell without the mark of the beast that they would have received then during the seven years tribulation. And if they received the mark of the beast, well, then they were not saved anymore. Then they were not going to be with the bridegroom anymore. So this clearly shows us it happens before the seven years of tribulation. And this piece warns us to ensure that we are baptized in water and in the Holy Spirit and that we strive after a life of sanctification so that we don't have to run around then to get to somebody to baptize us or pray for us for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It will be too late because, remember, it will happen in the twinkling of an eye. And a friend of mine once said, But Tian, can you tell me why are these five wise virgins so unchristlike?" I said to him, What do you mean? He said, why don't they share their oil? Because isn't that the Christ-like thing to do, the Christian thing to do? And you know what? The Lord showed me. You cannot share. If you understand what the oil is about, if you understand that the oil refers to the baptism in water, and I discuss it in greater detail in my book, and that the oil refers to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the life of sanctification, it's not just the Holy Spirit. It's more than just the Holy Spirit. It's baptism in water, Baptism of the Holy Spirit and a life of sanctification. That's what the oil refers to. And then you will understand that you cannot share your baptism. You cannot share your water baptism with anybody else. You can testify about it, but you cannot share it. Everyone must get his own water baptism. You cannot share your baptism with the Holy Spirit. You can pray with somebody else to also be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But you cannot share your baptism with the Holy Spirit with him. You can testify about it, but you cannot share it. You cannot share your life of sanctification with somebody else. It is your own. He must go and live his own life of sanctification. That is why the five wise virgins cannot share their oil with the foolish virgins. So, in which part are you falling? The wise or the foolish virgins? It's a decision you must make. And it says, and they that were ready, look at that, they that were ready, went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Take note, that only they that were ready went into the marriage with the bridegroom. 
But remember that the bridegroom usually went to fetch his bride and then to return with her to the bridal chamber. From that we can deduct that the five wise virgins are still not the bride because the bride will come with the bridegroom. But they were part of the marriage guests. This confirms that not everybody in the rapture will be part of the bride. How can I say this? Well, let's look at Adam's body. When Adam was upon the earth, where was his bride? Eve was one rib in the body of Adam. Now the Bible says that Jesus is the last Adam. So who will be his bride? Not his whole body, but the bride will come out of his body. Just as Adam's bride, Eve, came out of his body. So not the whole body. So which part will you be? Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. From this it is clear that those who are not ready for the return of the bridegroom, although they are virgins, believers, they will stay behind in the tribulation. That tells us that there will be believers staying behind. That is why we must watch and pray at all times and ensure that we are ready, baptized, and baptized in the Holy Spirit and striving after sanctification. So how can we say that they will stay behind in the tribulation if they are believers? Uh, remember the verse that says that God will spend His vengeance upon them that are not obedient to His gospel? So if you do not obey the gospel, you will stay behind in the vengeance of God. Now this is a picture of a true to scripture rendering of the tabernacle of Moses near Timnah in the Negev desert in Israel. This is what the tabernacle of Moses looked like. It, uh, it had only one entrance. Then there was the outer court, the holy place and the holy of holies as you see it there. In the outer court was the altar of sacrifice and then there was the bronze laver and then when you went in you saw some of the other items that I will show you now. And it's interesting to note that in the Hebrew Bible all these things have specific uh, uh, values. It's called gematria. And the value of the outer court is 20 times 20 times 10 is 4,000, referring to the Old Testament period from Adam to Jesus. And then the holy place, 20 times 10 times 10, that's 2,000, referring to the 2,000 years from Jesus to where we are today. And then the most holy place is 10 times 10 times 10, that's 1,000, referring to the 1,000 years of the millennium, all written into this tabernacle. If you enter it, you find there's one door, then there's the altar of burnt offering, as I said, then there's the bronze laver, that's the outer court. Then you go into the tent. On your left-hand side, you find the golden candlestick of the menorah that has 66 knobs. Why 66 knobs? Because the Bible says the whole of Scripture is Holy Spirit breathed. How many books do we find in the Bible? 66. Any Bible that does not have 66 books is not Holy Spirit breathed. So watch out for the Apocrypha. Because that also comes from the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Bible has 73 books. No, your Bible has 66 books. Because there are 66 knobs in the menorah. Then we have the altar of incense. We have the table of showbread in the holy place. And then if you go into the Holy of Holies, you find the Ark of the Covenant. That's what it looked like. Now, how is that applicable to us as believers today? Well, number one, we receive Jesus and we enter into the door because Jesus said in John 10 verse 9 that I am the door. Then we start to die to ourselves. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. So I start to burn away myself on the altar of sacrifice. Then the bronze laver refers to being baptized. And that thing was big enough so that the priest could wash themselves in that bronze laver. It's not just like a baptismal font that we find in any of the traditional churches. So that refers to the baptism in water, the believer's baptism. And then the menorah refers to baptism with the Holy Spirit. The altar of incense refers to my daily intimate prayer with the Lord. I, but the table of showbread refers to my daily appearance before God. I explain this in much more detail in my book. I really don't have time now. And then I can go through that and I grow to a place of intimate relationship with God. A daily life of sanctification in His presence and His glory. So I grow. I get in to the door by receiving the Lord Jesus. And then I grow to this place. And look at the bottom. I wrote there, five foolish virgins. They are the people who refuse to have themselves baptized. Because they listen to the opinions of people. 
Then we have the five virgins in the holy place. And then we have the bridegroom and the bride in the holy of holies. Where did the door close according to Matthew 25? When the bridegroom returned. It closed before the noses of the five foolish virgins. So where are you? Are you still, around, still running around the water of baptism? Are you still listening to the opinions of other people refusing to have yourself baptized as a believer? Because you are playing with the rapture. You are playing with that door being closed before you as a believer staying behind. Why? Because you obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ that says repent and be baptized. A baby cannot repent and be baptized. So my dear brother and sister, repent and be baptized so that you can walk into the place of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Because we see the verse is John 3 verse 5 where Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And that water does not refer to the physical water of birth in the mother's womb. It refers to the water of baptism. And again, not baptism at the baptismal font with a few drops of water on your face. It is being immersed like Jesus was baptized and all the disciples were baptized. And we must understand this. Except a man be born of water, baptized in water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. If you look at the tabernacle again, you will not enter that holy place and the holy of holies. Because the water, the baptismal uh, part is outside of the tent. You can only go into the tent after you have washed yourself. Repent and be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the following step, walking into the tent and then being baptized with the Holy Spirit. So you have a decision to make. If you have been growing up in some traditional church, in the Roman Catholic Church or traditional Pentecostal or any other church and you've not been baptized yet, it is time to get yourself baptized as quickly as possible. Because it's one of the conditions for being ready for the rapture. You must understand one thing. The rapture has got nothing to do with just going to heaven and going to hell. The rapture is about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Of being ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. So that we can be out of the world. So that God can throw out His vengeance, His wrath upon the earth. On those who do not know Him. And those who did not obey His gospel. So are you going to sit there much longer not obeying His gospel. Even though you are a believer. Are you going to be a five foolish part of the five foolish virgins or do you want to become a wise virgin do you want to become a wise virgin who starts to believe the word of god as it is written and start to do what it says because in luke 6 verse 46 jesus says why do you call me lord lord and you do not do what i say you've got a decision to make at number eight let us now look at saved in the tribulation will people get saved in the tribulation oh most definitely during the tribulation, we will see this huge global harvest coming in that people think will happen before Jesus comes. It will happen during the tribulation. Revelation 7 verse 9 to 15 says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. You see where they come from? And they have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. But how will they end up there? Let's see. Revelation 20 verse 4 says, And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image. When is that? During the tribulation period. Neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands during the great tribulation. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So how will they end up before the throne during the tribulation? They will have to be beheaded. And what do we know if most Christians are not on earth anymore? Which is the second biggest uh, uh, religion on earth? Islam. And what do they do with those who do not follow them? They cut off their heads. And what else? 
Look at this picture here. Have you seen that before? That is called the guillotine. People say, what are you talking about? Well, the Bible says they will be beheaded. And this is part of what will happen. And my dear friends, again, I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg. There is enough information out there regarding FEMA camps in America and other parts of the world, world FEMA, F-E-M-A. You can go and study it for yourself. And about the fact that many of these guillotines have been put into operation and are bringing and, and that they've been ordered to be put into some of these camps and all these kinds of things. And every time somebody posts something like this, immediately it's blasted as a hoax. There is no such thing. Well, the Bible says the people will be beheaded. The people will be shepherded into those camps, into these isolation facilities, as we see happening now with the coronavirus. And what will happen in those facilities? It's not happening now. What we are seeing now is just the forerunners of what will happen during the seven years of tribulation. In those camps, during the seven years of tribulation, the people will be herded into those places, those who stand up for their faith, because they have now understood that Jesus really did come. It was, just, it was not just a pie in the sky. Their parents were telling them the truth. Their fathers, their mothers, their brothers, their sisters, their husbands, their wives were telling them the truth. So now they know Jesus is really coming again. So now they stand up for their faith and they, then they get beheaded. And the moment they get beheaded, they end up with us in front of the throne immediately. And just to show you that the guillotine is being brought into society, look at this article that I'm showing you now. A nationwide shortage of a key ingredient used in lethal injections has led some states to experiment with new untested drug cocktails for executing death row inmates. The practice has raised moral and constitutional questions and unleashed a wave of litigation. At this point as a society, we should be asking whether we can stand by and watch as this barbaric practice continues. Are these iffy drug combinations really any better than the guillotine? Bringing back the guillotine may sound crazy, but it's certainly better than the current alternative. It's better for prisoners because quickly severing the head is believed to be one of the quickest, least painful ways to die. And it's better for organ recipients because the bodies of guillotine prisoners could be more quickly harvested for viable parts, unlike organs that may become unsuitable after lethal injection due to hypoxemia. And people, there you see it. And I also in my book show that they've brought in statutes in America and some of the states for death by guillotine. So this is already in place. But this will happen during the seven years of tribulation. And just to show you that the tribulation... And what will happen is not just a modern doctrine, as many people scoff. We read in Isaiah 26, verse 20 and 21, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation, whose indignation? God's indignation, be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. This has not happened yet in the past. When will this happen? During the seven years of tribulation. What will happen to the devil? Revelation 20 verse 1 to 10 says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. That is when Jesus comes back to earth. Satan will be bound for a thousand years that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. Which are those nations? Those are the mortal people still on the earth, having come through the seven years of tribulation, having lived through the thousand years. Now Satan is going to try and deceive them. Remember, we with immortal bodies, the same immortal bodies as Jesus has, cannot be deceived again. And these people that he will gather together, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to, ba to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, which is the beloved city, Jerusalem, because Jesus will be setting up his palace. We read about that uh, 
temple that Jesus will build in Ezekiel 40 to 47. That will be the temple that Jesus himself will sit in, that he will build himself. They will encompass the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So look at this. There's no war here. So this is not the Gog and Magog war, as I said at the beginning. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are for a thousand years already, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So here we see it in that picture. When Jesus comes with his second coming, the Antichrist and the false prophet is put in the lake of fire. Then we have the thousand years of peace where Jesus will reign, sitting in the temple in Jerusalem as king and priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Satan will be bound for a thousand years. After a thousand years, he will be loosened for a short season. And then he will deceive the Gog and the Magog, the nations upon the earth. They will rebel against God. And then fire from heaven will devour them. And Satan will be put into the lake of fire. Only then comes the great white throne judgment. And only after that, eternity starts with the new heaven and the new earth. So again, does this not make you excited? To know that we're waiting for this, that we're going to this place. If you're not excited yet, if you're in fear yet, you say, Dan, you're making me afraid. Better get ready. So stop listening to the fear of the devil and get to a place of praying this prayer at the end of this video when I'm finished and starting to read the Bible for yourself and starting to live a life of sanctification, ensuring that you're baptized, ensuring that you're baptized with the Holy Spirit and walking out, walking in the walk of righteousness, living a life of righteousness with God. And then you can know Nothing to worry about. When Jesus comes, he comes. And if he does not come and I die before the time, I'm with him. I know I'm ready. Both ways. At number nine, let's end with the great significance of the rapture. Professor Johan Malan wrote the following regarding the rapture. In the light of all the biblical facts about the rapture, you see all the biblical facts, because there are many biblical facts about the rapture. It is clear that this is an extremely important teaching to all Christian believers. There are at least 12 different aspects of the rapture that need to be properly understood and taken account of. Number one, it is a direct intervention by God. The supernatural nature of the rapture in which millions of Christians will be caught up in the air will be so clearly an intervention by God that no scientific explanation will ever account for this astounding phenomenon. The Lord himself will remove the saints from planet earth. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16. Number two, it is a meeting with the Lord Jesus. When the Lord Jesus descends from heaven with the sounding of the trumpet of God, those who died in Christ will be raised from the dead, while the living believers will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Together they will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 and 17. The unsaved people will not see him on this occasion as I discussed earlier. Number three, it is associated with the first resurrection. The rapture is directly related to the first resurrection when all believers will receive glorified resurrection bodies. Those who have died in Christ will be raised first. Then the living believers will be miraculously changed while they pass from mortality to immortality without dying. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52. Number four, it separates true and nominal believers. Apart from the division that the rapture will effect between the saved and unsaved people in the world, it will also separate born-again believers from the nominal Christians within the professing church, Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13, many of whom have only a form of godliness, 2 Timothy 3, verse 5. Number five, it marks the end of the church age. It is important to consider the rapture in its dispensational context. It is at the end of the church age and just before the beginning of the tribulation period, which will be a distinct dispensation with its own characteristics, 2 Thessalonians 2. Number six, it makes way for the revelation of the Antichrist. The rapture is directly related to the revelation of the Antichrist. The true church of Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, is withholding the Antichrist, who can only be revealed after the church has been taken out of the way, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 6 to 10. Number seven, it is an escape from divine wrath. The rapture also constitutes a dramatic rescue operation in which true believers will be removed from the scene of impending divine judgments upon earth 
since they are not the objects of God's wrath, as I said. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, and Luke 21 verse 36. Number 8, it is a motivation for steadfastness. There will be a great end time falling away from the truth of God's word, not a global harvest before the rapture. Christians having the hope of Christ's coming purify themselves as he is pure, 1 John 3 verse 3, and resist any tendency to grow cold in their love for him, Matthew 24 verse 12. Number nine, it is a summons to the judgment seat of Christ. The certainty of the rapture confronts us with the solemn prospect of appearing before Christ at his judgment seat to give account of our lives, Romans 14 verse 10 and 12, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. Number 10. It is a journey to the marriage of the Lamb. After appearing before the judgment seat, believers forming the bride will be united to the heavenly bridegroom, never to be separated from him again. Revelation 19 verse 7 to 8, Psalm 45 verse 9. Number 11. It is a journey to our eternal home. The Lord Jesus promised that he would return to take the saints away to their heavenly abode in his Father's house with the many mansions. John 14 verse 2 and 3. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. What a wonderful future to look forward to. And number 12. It will promote us to be co-rulers with Christ. After the rapture and the tribulation period, the glorified saints will return with Christ and reign with him as kings here on earth. Luke 19 verse 17 to 19, 2 Timothy 2 verse 12, Revelation 2 verse 26 to 27, and Revelation 5 verse 10. He also says, The unscriptural teaching of a mid-tribulation or a post-tribulation rapture leads to a warped perspective and wrong priorities. Instead of awaiting the coming of Christ, people are awaiting the Antichrist. In this way, they compromise their commitment to Christ. Instead of striving for sanctification in expectation of the imminent coming of the heavenly bridegroom, they start planning an earthly survival strategy for the tribulation period. Such activities are irrelevant as they are motivated by a distorted prophetic vision of future events. And this is what we must understand. We have all these doomsday preppers preparing themselves and building fortresses and, you know, going down into the earth. The Bible says, even if they dig into hell, my hand will take them out of there. Even if they climb up into heaven, my hand will take them out of there. So even if you go and live on a space station, God will bring you down upon this earth. If you're disobedient to his gospel and if you do not know him, you will be upon the earth for those seven years of tribulation. You will not be in space somewhere. You will not be somewhere down in the ground. God will take you out of there. You will not be able to escape this. The only way to escape this is to get ready, to ensure that you're in a relationship with Jesus, to ensure that you're baptized, baptized with the Holy Spirit, striving after sanctification, living a life of sanctification, a life of righteousness, finding out what righteousness is all about, and then you can be ready. So when he comes, you will be out of here to be with Jesus for the seven years, coming back with him, thousand years, and then all eternity. What a wonderful future to look forward to. But just to give yourself a little idea of what it might look like when it happens. Let's just watch this little video quickly. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good.
The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month. Or he might come next week. Or he could even come... video eh? where will you be when that happens you see the decision is yours because it might happen today it might happen tomorrow yes and it might happen 10 years from now I am ready because I love a living God because Jesus said in the Revelation 1 verse 17 and 18 fear not I'm the first and the last I'm he that liveth and was dead and behold I'm alive forevermore amen and all honor and glory goes to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I will be with him in all eternity. So let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've planned all this for us at the beginning of time. And that we can know that if we make ourselves ready, that we will be with you in the bridal chamber. That we will be with you in heaven while all the rest of these things, the tribulation, the wrath, the vengeance is poured out upon the earth. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will convict the people watching this message of mine, that they will get themselves ready, that they will fall on their knees, that they will pray the prayer at the back of this video to receive you in their lives, Lord, and that they will stand up for their faith, that they will get themselves baptized, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and that they will strive after sanctification so that you can be glorified in their lives. And Lord Jesus, we call out today, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Amen.